Thanks very much, Greg. I really enjoyed that. Um, so, Kendall Walton has this terminology I'll just mention because it's useful to pose in this question. He distinguishes between standard and variable features of a kind. Yep. So, if you're if you're working in some art form, there are standard features. Works in this art form will tend to have these non-aesthetic features, um, and um, there are variable features. Works in this art form will vary with respect to. The they may have them. They may not. Yeah, so painting flatness is standard, and the, just the arrangement of colors on the surface is variable. Yeah. You seem to be assuming that only the variable features of photography and film are aesthetically relevant. But that doesn't seem right. It seems like the standard features of a medium can also be aesthetically relevant. So if you, you've decided to write a sonnet, the, rhyme, the, the meter is going to be determined for you, and the rhyme scheme will be determined for you. But that, that meter and the rhyme scheme, scheme contributes to your aesthetic appreciation of the work. Yeah, yeah. So I, I never wanted to say, and I hope I never will say, that standard features are, features standard for a medium are aesthetically re irrelevant to any judgment that we might make about a work in that medium. Um, what I did say was that the coincidence of photographic and cinematographic images which is a standard feature for photography and, and cinema and not a standard feature for painting and drawing is a feature with virtually no aesthetic interest for us in, in when we're interested in those media, namely cinema and photography. But the argument I gave for that wasn't these are standard features, standard features are aesthetically irrelevant, therefore they're aesthetically irrelevant. I hope I didn't give the impression of... A, of of, of appealing to that general and certainly invalid form of argument. The argument was to do with the specifics of the kinds of activity that results in marks on a photographic surface as compared with the kind of activity that results in the marks on a, on a painterly surface. Your point was about the control, the, tr the degree of choice that the artist has over the surface? Well, the, the argument was that where there are um, there are marks on cinematic images but those rel the relation between the marks and what is represented in the photograph are, is not an aesthetically interesting relationship because the marks are produced simply in the act of attending to and focusing on the object that you wish to represent. Those marks are, as it were, a byproduct of the activity of photographing the thing that's out there, <laughs> whereas, of course, that's very different in the case of a, of a, a painterly image where one makes decisions about what marks to put on the canvas in order to create a certain representational structure. Maybe there is, yeah, this is a follow-up on what you were just saying and on Don's question. Right. Um, I mean, it seems to me that sometimes the way in which mm -hmm. a photographic surface is marked clearly reflects various decisions that have been made by the person producing that image, uh, and where these are features that the image has as a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional scene. Mm 
So I'm thinking, for example, of some of the geometrical properties, compositional properties, of pictures by Cartier-Bresson that he was very much aware of in talking about his own photography. I'm thinking also about the effects of using particular kinds of lenses in taking a picture. For example, taking a telephoto lens to completely flatten out space. In all of these cases, clearly these are marks visible on the surface that don't reflect what we would have seen had we been there. Um, they, they're a, an artifact of the photographic process. So are you saying that in these cases as well, mm. um, we can't take in those marks on the photographic surface the same kinds of interest that we take in the marks in a painting? OK. Right, good. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so there are certainly pic photographs where the geometry of the picture surface doesn't correspond to any geometrical arrangement of objects in the space photographed that you would see from any point of view. And to that extent, the geometry of the image is an artifact of the photographic process and not a record of a distribution of, not, not a faithful re record of the distribution of objects in space. Just wondering, so that, that's true. I, I just wonder what I said that would be inconsistent with that. So, well, I, I take it that what I'm suggesting is that these kinds of artifactual features of photographic images can serve a representational purpose. They can be ways of representing a subject in a certain way. Therefore, they seem analogous to the kinds of things that we would take an interest in in paintings, where we see certain features of the marks on a painting as indicating how the painter is representing the subject. That's why it seems to me that it seemed as if you were suggesting that we couldn't take that kind of interest. You were saying that that's, in a sense, what's right in the scrutiny charge. That's why we might be tempted to go even further and say there can't be representational art in photography. What I said was right in the scrutiny view was that there's an important relationship between the marks that are on the surface in a painting, let's forget drawing for a minute, which is aesthetically relevant, which has no parallel in the photographic case. So that relationship, which, is, which holds importantly in the painterly case and doesn't hold in the photographic case, is that these marks, where they are visible, are traces of the activity of the artist. Now, I think that doesn't hold in the photographic case, and it doesn't hold even if you take a Cartier-Bresson photograph where um, there has been flattening in order to achieve a certain kind of uh, geometry of the surface. Isn't, isn't that right? I'm not sure why you're saying that in that case uh, we can't see these as traces of the activity of the photographer. But remember what traces are, in my sense. Traces are not just information about something that the artist did, because of course, sure, there's information carried in, um, in a photograph uh, by, by, the, by the distribution of marks on it, about what the artist, what the photographer did. I think but, I'm using traces in your sense here. But traces for me are those marks which encourage us to recapitulate the movement simulatively. Or the activity. The activity simulatively. 
Okay, so do you want to say that when we see such a photograph, we're encouraged to simulate the act of taking the photograph? I guess, I guess somebody could argue that. Maybe, maybe that... I, didn't, I wasn't sure that was where you were going with this, but, but okay, okay, I see. Okay, okay. Um, that would be a very kind of theory-driven sort of simulation, I think. But it's, I, I hadn't thought of that, actually. Um, but this, even, even if that's right, I think there's still something significantly different between the two cases in the sense that one may with the painting, one way, admire the way in which the patch of colour has been put on the surface so as to achieve this representational effect. And one doesn't think about patches on a photograph in the same way because those patches are just imposed on the image by the reflection of the objects that you've chosen to focus on. I mean, what you've done as a photographer is you've chosen some objects to photograph and you've chosen an angle from which to do it and you've chosen a kind of lens with which to do it in certain kind of lighting situations. That's what you've achieved. You haven't decided to put that patch in that particular place. That patch is in that place because of the way in which you chose to photograph those objects in that scene. Sorry, the difference between traces and marks depends on the... Don't say there's a difference between... I mean, it, it, traces are a subset yeah, of marks. But where, where the boundary of this subset is depends on the beholder, uh, on, on his particular procedural knowledge. For a photographer, there are certainly much more marks, much more traces in a photo than for someone who has never taken a photography. Or in, in, a, in, in a drawing, there are like abstract property that for an expert draftsman will be seen as traces and that w would be seen as marks by someone without experience. Or, or do you want to you, you would not accept a kind of relativity of the <laughs> of what are marks uh, of what are traces. Sorry. Could you try that? I I, did, I just didn't quite get that. Sorry. I, I maybe I didn't get your point, but I have the I, impression that the way you define uh, traces depends on the knowledge of a particular observer, and in particular is procedural is know how. Uh, experience in that particular kind of uh, media. Like for a photographer, it's, it's a follow-up of this question. For, for a photographer, there will be some uh, marks on the, on the photo that will be automatically connected with some uh, actions. And so there will be, they, 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 there will be uh, traces and not just marks. And instead for another person, uh, there will I mean, one, one interesting question that I, I think this relates to, which I thought of when I was listening to uh, one of the papers earlier this morning, was the extent to which one's tendency to respond simulatively to marks on a picture, a, a painting or a drawing, might be uh, dependent upon various aspects of one's own experience. So one would expect from what we know about the way in the, these things work that artists would be actually better at simulating those things than, um, than naive um, viewers of pictures would be. Um, so to that extent, I, I'm, I'm happy to say I'm happy to counter it. I don't know whether it's true, but it very well may be true that there are differences in our ex our, uh, the extent of our responses to traces, and it's not, not absolutely uniform. Um, I, I would, on the other hand, think of it as something which is a kind of natural tendency and which is uh, for which uh, 
um, all normally developing human beings have some capacity. I understand that in, that's the explanation for how it is that we read handwriting so that we recapitulate the movements and, and even when the handwriting's pretty bad and it's not very evident from the geometry of the of the figure what letter it represents a recapitulation of the movement gives us a clue about what the what the letter actually is so we don't you know we don't learn that that's something which is just sort of sort of given to us so I, I think of the uh, these, these things as being traces which are more or less available to us, though one can develop one's skill in this respect. But I'm, I'm still having a bit of problem. When you say, <coughs> I think you're wanting to say that we can think about the surface of a photograph as bear, uh, and the, the marks on the surface as being traces. But what are they traces of? Kind of decision and actions of the photographer that are obviously more abstract than the a gesture in a drawing, for instance. But uh, that can be nevertheless recovered and simulated with the same kind of automaticity if the observer is a photographer himself. But so, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I don't think I've quite answered this. Well, it's not, not, not a question, just a comment. I, um, <clears throat> I was thinking of the difference between painting and photography in terms of is it possible for a photographer to leave some marks or traces of his activity as a photographer. And I, I was thinking of some interesting uh, <coughs> photographs by um, Michael Snow, and in Michael Snow, sometimes he moves the camera at the, at the moment of shooting. And so you can see in, in, in the photograph this movement. And I think it's a way, I don't know what, what yeah. to think of it, a, a way of showing and making visible the activity of the photographer as a, as a mark of... Uh, yes. I mean, I, I don't know quite what I want to say about that particular case. But there are certainly going to be cases where you'll, we will want to say that we have a photograph which does uh, bear traces in my sense of the activity of the artist. So, so if you just think of those Stan Brackage uh, films where, yeah. where he actually puts marks yeah. on the yeah. film, <laughs> you know, th th that, that can be done. So, you know, that's possible. I, I, I'm, so I'm not offering, a, I'm not, as it were, aiming to present you with a, a, a thesis which holds of absolutely everything that we might possibly think of as being a photograph or a cinematic image. I'm trying to account for some of the differences in the way that we respond to what you might call standard photographs, standard cinematic images. But those other kinds of cases are certainly of interest and I, I haven't said anything about them, yeah. No? Maybe you have answered, okay. but um, uh, I, I agree with almost all you said. I'm glad um, to hear it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially about the difference between transparency and experience transparency okay. and the fact that uh, the, the real question, the good question is uh, uh, is uh, the coincidence uh, a salient feature of the image or not? And, uh, but uh, you seem to assume that um, all photographic image uh, produces a coincident coincidence, a coincident image. And no. I'm, I, was, I was thinking not of uh, Cartier-Bresson, but of uh, all these, the um, all these uh, these uh, photographs of the uh, of the the beginning of color photography uh, with the three I don't know the name in English uh, three chromy mm. and uh, autochromes mm. uh, where you can see some patches and uh, for me these uh, these kinds of photographs are not coincident pictures. Um, what do yeah. you think no, of no, this? So I, 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 I didn't want to say 
that photographs are always coincident. Uh, and that there are plenty of photographs and occasionally f cinematic images where there is failure of coincidence. And I gave, gave the example from the Bergman film yeah. of a cinematic image which is non-coincident. Non uh, so the question then is, well, when we have non-coincidence, what kind of interest does that have? What, what, what would be an, a, 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 an appropriate uh, l kind of interest in it? Would, would it have aesthetic interest? Yes, yes it would. Um, so the decision to uh, blow up that shot at the end of the film so that you, the eventually the grain becomes more and more visible is an aesthetic decision and one can think of it as a good decision to have made or maybe you think, well, it wasn't such a good idea after all. But that's certainly a way of thinking about that image in terms of the relation between what is represented and the marks which support that representation because those marks are becoming very visible at that point. But the point was simply that even in cases which I think, you know, in cinema at least are unusual, where we do take an interest in the relationship between what is represented and the marks which support the representation, that is a different kind of interest from the interest that we take when we think about the relationship between what a painting or a drawing represents and the marks on the surface which support that representation because of the different ways in which those marks are put on that image. Uh, I'm not sure my question is the right question because probably I didn't exactly understand your point of view. Uh, for me, photography is not only the moment uh, and the decision of the photograph to do a picture, but it's also the print process. The printing process. Yeah, the printing process. Right. It can trans right. transform right. completely or in different way the image. And there is the new tendency which is very contemporary, that photography, famous photography, use Photoshop to change again the image. Yeah. So this, if you are agree with me, how do you put these two process yeah. Yeah. in well, your context, in your... Uh, uh, yeah, in, in the sort of recent philosophical literature on this, which I'm sort of this is just a kind of appendix to, there, there is a general, there's a sort of attitude towards that problem which people have taken, which I, I think is probably right, and which goes something like this. Yes, there are all sorts of things that you can do with photographs, and these days there are more and more of those things that you can do with photographs, to the point that the distinction between f photographs and what we call handmade images starts to blur. Uh, and at that point, you can't really have the sort of discussion that I've been trying to have here. So, you know, I, I'm speaking here uh, as other people have tended to speak in this philosophical literature about photographs where those kinds of um, massive interventions at post-taking of the picture stage uh, are, are thought not to be available to us or, or we just sort of forget about them altogether. Um, so I'm interested really in our different ways of responding to paintings on the one hand and to what you might call standard old-fashioned cinema. <laughs> you know, where you just put a camera in front of somebody, you take, the, you take the shot, you edit it, you do various things, but you don't do all the Photoshop kind of stuff. Once you start to introduce that sort of thing, then the line between these two things starts to blur. And when that blurs, then there isn't any longer a distinction to discuss. So I would like just to ask you a question about experience transparency. Yeah. Uh, 
when, when you know that you are <coughs> looking at a photograph, you, you might uh, enjoy a kind of experience transparency. When, when you are taught, this is actually a painting. So you, you don't experience transparency anymore in your scheme. So and I if, have, is, I it, is it a... Uh, is so I have a photograph, but somebody tells me it's a painting. Yeah, so you, so yeah, I think you, switch, painting. you switch from uh, experiencing transparency to not experiencing transparency. So is it really an experience? Or in one sense, experience transparency is a transpa it's an experience if it is so cognitively penetrable. Right. Um, so so I'm, given, I'm given something to look at. I think it's a photograph. Yeah. It isn't. It's a very, very carefully done photorealist painting. Uh, and I start off by thinking that, pa by paying no attention, as it were, to the fact that there are no visible marks on the surface. That just doesn't seem to me to be significant in any way, because I take this to be a photograph. Now you tell me, actually it's a painting and suddenly it occurs to me to think wow there is something interesting about the surface here namely the extent to which the marks on the surface have been erased in the process of making the picture doesn't that seem like a a pretty natural reaction to have yes but uh, so was it an illusion of Transparency? Was it an illusion of transparency? The first condition. On, on yeah. Um, so what would you say in that case? Was it, would it, was it an illusion of transparency? That sounds, it sounds a little bit dramatic for what's going on, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's not a bad description. It's, uh, uh, let's go with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so, David, David? Thank you very much.